Good morning, everybody. All right, I'd love to have you open your Bibles and turn with me to the last book in the Bible, to Revelation. Revelation uh, chapter 3. We are in week 6 of this uh, series called Seven Letters. And so next week, we will be covering the letter to the church Laodicea. And then the following week will be the letter to the church Journey Mennonite. And so we need your help with this. Um, we would love to have your feedback turned in by this Sunday, if you could do that. Uh, week one, we handed out these forms that give you an opportunity to listen to the Spirit and to say, God, what are you saying to Journey? What are the images of Christ that we need to pay attention to? What are the affirmations? What would God maybe say to us to say, yeah, I, I see you, I see these things that you're doing, and I, I'm encouraged encouraging you in them. What are the critiques? Are there things that God might look at us and say, well, yeah, but I have this against you, or here's a critique? And um, then finally, what are the promises Christ might be making to the church? And so if you don't have this, if you lost it or left it at home, you can pick one up at the Connection Center. Uh, would love to have you take time to fill this out today, hopefully prayerfully, and then turn it in at that same Connection Center. And then we will do that in a couple weeks. Sometimes, like, just a little switch in worship is a good thing. Like we can get so used to just like facing one direction and, and just kind of doing the routine. We sit in the same seats every week and all that, which is kind of a funny turn of events for those of you who sit in the back all the time uh, that now we're looking at you. Um, this is good in a couple of ways. It, it, it shakes things up. Um, I can clap up here and nobody tells, nobody can see how bad my rhythm is. And uh, our tech guys get really uncomfortable when we look at them. So we love you guys very much. Thanks for what you do. So... Um, so this morning, uh, we're looking at this letter to the church of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Uh, Philadelphia here in uh, first century Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. This is a namesake for the Philadelphia we all know uh, in Pennsylvania, the city of brotherly love, which is ironic because uh, as we read <clears throat> this letter from Revelation 3, realize that, uh, that there was not a lot of love between the brothers. Um, the conflict that these Christians were facing wasn't within the church. It was from pressures outside of the church, but it wasn't from like some of the other cities we've looked at. It wasn't from like the, those who are worshiping the emperor or those who are worshiping the Greek and Roman gods. The pressure they were getting were from Jews, people who were kind of their, their cousins, their brothers and sisters. Uh, Jesus was a Jew, and the movement Jesus began, this thing called the way, and eventually Christianity, was from within inside the Jewish faith. And yet, there was a tremendous amount of pressure, and you'll, you'll hear that when we read this letter, from the Jews there in Philadelphia against this little movement called uh, the church. And this church in Philadelphia was, was small, um, pretty insignificant, a tiny little church, but Jesus, like, he speaks in this tone of, of incredible love and encouragement to them. Uh, it's only one of only two letters of these seven we've looked at where there are no critiques at all, no criticisms. Jesus never looks at the church in Philadelphia and says, but I have this against you. It's all sort of encouragement and blessing. And so um, hear that as we look at this together. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. To the angel in the church of Philadelphia, write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and act and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command and endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, 
which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. God, we ask that we would have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name. So, uh, we have these images of the risen Christ here. Um, Jesus is revealing himself. That's what the word re- revelation, uh, it's literally the word apocalypsis uh, in Greek, which is where we get the word apocalypse. Uh, remember uh, that the apocalypse does not mean doomsday. It does not mean the end of the world. It does not mean, you know, fear and trembling. The word apocalypse just means revelation. Something is being revealed. The curtain of reality is being pulled back, and we're invited to sort of look behind the curtain at what is true, what is really real. And so Jesus is revealing himself. There is this apocalypse that's happening. And the way Jesus reveals himself here to the church in Philadelphia is this. He says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. Now, if you're going to read this in the original language, you, it would... <clears throat> You would hear it this way. These are, the word, these are the words of the Holy One and the True One. And maybe, like, if you've been a sort of a student of the Bible and you've read the Old Testament, those words will kind of start to ring in your ears a little bit. They're echoes from the Old Testament. Because all throughout the Old Testament, God is referred to again and again and again as the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. Do you recognize that? Uh, for example, in uh, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4, here's just one of dozens and dozens of examples. Isaiah 1, verse 4 says, They, the people, have spurned the Holy One of Israel. Spurned. That's another word we don't use often enough. I'm feeling really spurned this morning. Um, maybe, I don't know. We can bring that back into our language. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and have turned their backs on Him. Um, And so, again, God is revealed as the Holy One of Israel, and that's how Jesus reveals himself here. Now, think again about this conflict that's happening between Jews, who the Old Testament is their story. They are the people of Israel, right? And there's this incredible conflict that these Christians are saying that Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament Israel, And, and they're not really willing to accept that. You see, what can happen with this phrase, the Holy One of Israel, is the of Israel can be the part we start to focus on. That the Holy One is ours. It becomes possessive, as if God could be domesticated, as if God could belong to us. He is ours, and so we start sort of defending. That's is a little bit of what... Uh, I think Jesus is saying here, he, Jesus, is the Holy One of Israel. He is the one who, um, who came to Abraham and called him into a missionary life, who sent him on an adventure of blessing the whole world. He is the one who, who gave the commandments, who gave the, the laws to sort of guide the people on how best to live. He is the one who inspired the prophets, who raised up kings. He was the one who was with the people. Jesus is the embodiment of the Holy One of Israel. Now, that might sound, okay, we get that, right? Like, we have 2,000 years of history to, like, appreciate that, that Jesus is the embodiment of God. I mean, the actual embodiment of God. And yet, if you can put yourself in a place where that was absolutely revolutionary, that, that, that God had sort of taken on flesh and blood, that God had lived in the skin of Jesus for 30 years and nobody noticed. Can you imagine that? I mean, God moved into the neighborhood in Jesus and lived and worked as a humble carpenter for 30 years and nobody noticed. It's just kind of like he was content to just sort of go about life and, and do his work and worship God and learn and grow. Like, it's unbelievable to me. And then all of a sudden, one day, he, he gets baptized by John, and he starts announcing the kingdom of God is at hand. The message of the Christians, our message still today, is that Jesus is the embodiment of God. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at the person of Jesus of Nazareth. This is, this is a beautiful, unbelievable mystery. And one of the reasons why it was so hard for Jews to receive that is because Jesus was crucified. Right? I mean, you're telling me, right, if I'm a Jew, 
you're trying to convince me that Jesus is the Holy One of Israel. You're telling me that your God, that this God that we worship, was hung on a cross. This can't be true. No God would do this, especially not the Holy God of Israel. Because Deuteronomy very clearly says that anyone who is hung on a tree is cursed by God. So how, how can this be God? And so uh, there was this, this incredible tension. Um, we've always, when we think about God, what we always tend to do is take our ideas about what God must be like and superimpose them onto what God is really like. So when we think about what God must be like, we think, well, when God is revealed as holy, the word holy, it means set apart. It means different, completely unique. To be holy means that there is nothing sort of like this in all of creation, that God is completely unique. And so what we've thought is like, well, okay, so what it must mean for God to be holy is that God will never sully himself in the reality of human sin. I mean, that, that, that this world, that this dirty, sort of ugly world that has been tainted by human sin, God would never sort of sully himself in all of that, so God must be pretty far removed from that. That's what holiness must mean. So we take our idea of holiness and superimpose it on God. But the message of the Christians is that God's holiness is fully revealed in whom? In Jesus. That the word of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And the word of God actually entered into the sin of the world. He took it in his own body. He took it on himself. This is why the Apostle Paul says this. Um, Sort of in response to the Jews who had said, no, 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 this can't, Jesus can't be God because he was cursed, he was hung on a tree. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, he says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming the curse for us. Because it's written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. This is what holiness looks like. The holiness of God is not standing at a distance and sort of unwilling to enter into the sin. The holiness of God is fully revealed in the person of Jesus who became our sin, who took it on to himself, who took our curse away from us to free us from the curse. This is the Holy One of God. This is how Jesus is revealed. Now, if, you were in the, if we were like in the year 30, right? Um, which we wouldn't have called the year 30, but you know what I mean. So we're like in the year 30, and we, somebody starts talking about the cross. Everybody would have known what the cross is. And if I just said, like, so what are your ideas about this Roman instrument of death, torture, capital punishment? We would have said, well, what does the cross mean? Well, it's ugly. Like, it's horrifying. It's, it, it's, it's humiliating. People who were crucified were stripped naked. And hung on a cross. I mean, it was, a, it was an instrument of unbelievable humiliation. Because the Romans, what they wanted was for all of us, all of the other people, to say, this is what happens when you cross the empire. So they developed this horrible, horrible method of execution. So if we were in the year 30 and we said, what does a cross mean? That's what we would have said. So of course it's going to be so hard to believe that God was actually subjected to that kind of punishment. That God would do that. <clears throat> And yet, what does the cross mean today? How many of you are wearing crosses today? You know, some Protestants will tend, like for, for us, when we have a cross in front of our worship center, we don't have Jesus hanging on the cross. You know, most Protestants, we have the cross empty because Jesus isn't on the cross anymore, right? He was, he was raised from the dead. He's ascended to the right hand of the Father. So he's not on the cross. Catholics will have a crucifix, and so Jesus is on the cross in front of the worship center. I think both have really beautiful meaning to them. Um, but the cross, what does a cross mean today in 2017? Salvation, love, mercy, forgiveness, redemption, hope, joy, peace. The whole meaning of the cross has been completely inverted by Jesus. This is what he's done. And, and that's why Paul says, like, this is foolishness. It, it's foolishness uh, to think, but it is true. Do you know that human beings 
We could have tried to make up ideas about God for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years and we would have never dreamed of a God like this. We, we would never have made up a God like this. A God who would actually take our curse and become it for us. And this is how Jesus is revealed. This is the truth of who Jesus is. The distance, if you're going to draw, so I had this slide, um, if you're going to draw like a picture of Jesus in heaven and then Jesus on the cross, right? The distance between those two things, you could put like a sort of an, inf- you can draw this on your, on your paper. Um, Jesus in heaven, Jesus on the cross, and the distance between those two things, you can draw like a little infinite, uh, infinity symbol. Because Jesus could not have gone an inch further than he did to prove his love for humanity and to redeem us. He couldn't have gone any further because he became our sin. He became that which was completely opposed to his character. Sometimes, like, when I'm tucking the kids into bed, and I'm sure maybe you guys have done this too, like, you say, like, yeah, I love you. I love you too. I love you this much, right? I love you to the moon. How many of you have said that to your kids? I love you to the moon and back. Again, like, you just sort of keep going. It's a way of saying, like, you know, I love you so much, I can't even put it into words. Jesus loves you to the cross, and that distance could not, it could not be any greater. It's infinite. This is, the, this is the scandalous mystery of the Christian faith. That this is the God that we worship. And we can sort of sanitize it and we can, we can miss the, the radical nature of it. But here, here's what um, one of my favorite theologians, at least it's one of my favorite names to say. His name is Hans Ernst von Boltischar. So you can learn to say that. <clears throat> here's what he says. Being disguised under the disfigurement of an ugly crucifixion and death, Christ on the cross is paradoxically the clearest revelation of who God is. Do you know if the only thing we knew about God was Christ on the cross, we would know enough? That's why why Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, he says, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except what? Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is beautiful. This is the message. Jesus comes to them. He says, I am the holy one of God, the true one. And then uh, says these words. He says, I am the one who holds the key of David. Again, you hear this tension coming out between Jews and Christians because who is David? Well, David was like the star of the Old Testament. I mean, he was the one who rose above everyone else in the Old Testament. Now, David wasn't perfect, like he wasn't you know, fully sort of like redeemed, but he was, uh, he was humble, he repented, he was a man after God's own heart. You will be happy to know that your pastor is not fully redeemed. I overslept this morning. Um, and uh, it's not that, it's the first word that came out of my mouth after I overslept this morning. I mean, to wake up and to have the first words you say, oh, snap! Um, or it's, it's embarrassing to admit that, that, oh, snap, was what I first said. Um, so David, David um, he, he is the one, like, all other kings in the Old Testament are measured by David. They're like, uh, this king was, was evil because he didn't do right in the eyes of God like David had done. Or this king, uh, he, he, was, he was good, he was just like David, he had like David's heart. So David is like, for the people of Israel, he's the one they look to. And Jesus says, yes. And and he's the one who God made a covenant with and said, your descendants will always sit on the throne in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, but the the keys to David have been given to me. Like, I'm, I'm the one who has this whole history, this whole history of God's redeeming work. And it's me who has the authority, Jesus says. I hold the key, and the key to the kingdom of God, I have flung the door of it wide open. And what I open, nobody can shut, and what I shut, nobody can open. Jesus, like he's saying, the door to what God is doing, this door to the God's redeeming work that has been held by Israel up until the time of Jesus is now wide open so that anybody anywhere who puts their faith in this crucified God, who has taken our curse on himself, can be a part of it. If you, and I think we're probably all Gentiles in this room, um, none of us could like trace our, our genetics back to Abraham, uh, probably, in this room. Um, but if you, so if we Gentiles would come to this church in Philadelphia, um, early on, you know, it's, maybe it's a year 80 or 90, 
And, uh, and we've said, hey, I've heard about this Jesus, and I've heard this message of salvation through Jesus, and I want, I want in on it. I want to be a part of it. They would have said, fantastic. Um, so all you have to do is become a Jew first, and then you can believe in Jesus and worship this Jewish Messiah, which if you're a dude, is kind of a problem because it requires some surgery, minor surgery. Um, we can talk about that later if you have questions. Like, can you imagine, like, some, some Jewish evangelist is out on the street corner, and they're like, yes, like, believe in Jesus, become a Jew. Oh, and you're like, hey, like, what does that mean? W- wait, what? Excuse me? Um, so there was some surgery required. So for, but to get to Jesus, you had to go through the door of the Jewish faith, and Jesus says, no, no, no. The, the door has been opened, and you can actually come and put your trust in me, and the door of salvation, the door to the kingdom, the door of life with God, it is... I have the authority to open it. Um, Jesus then, he goes on, and he says something really beautiful. Um, Sort of jumping around here. Jesus says, he he looks at them and he says, uh, in verse 8, he says, I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. You have little strength strength. Um, Do you know that God doesn't need our strength? Like as an individual or as a church, like God doesn't need us to be powerful. He doesn't need us to be strong. He doesn't need our stuff. What God wants from us is our fidelity, our faithfulness, our commitment to him, to just to surrender our hearts to him. That's what God wants. Do you know why God doesn't need our strength? Because he has plenty of it. Like, he has plenty of power to go around. He raised Jesus from the dead. Um, and so God doesn't need our strength. But sometimes we can get caught in this trap of, like, we, we just need to, like, have, have power and power to control. And Jesus says, no, no, no. I know that you have little strength, but yet I've seen you. And Jesus says, I've opened a door for you. Like, I've opened this door to advance the gospel. And it's not going to come through your strength. It's not going to come through your skill. It's not going to come through all of your connections and your resources. It's going to come through my work and your faithfulness to my name. This is why the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. He says, but you, you said to me, my grace, this is God speaking to Paul. He says, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. When's the last time you started bragging about how like, weak you were, right? I mean, that's just, again, this is foolishness. I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness because it is in my weakness where my strength comes to an end that God's strength rests on us. How many of you have experienced this in your life? Like it was, it was a moment when you sort of came to the end of yourself. And, and I think confession is one of those ways where we just, we, we come to the end of ourselves in confession, where we just like pull the curtain back and we say, Here, here's what's going on inside of me. It's like the end of our strength and we confess. And it's at that moment of confession that God's strength sort of floods into our life. And so it's at the time, like maybe some of us are feeling like our bodies are just weak. They're sort of breaking down. And it's frustrating because where's our strength going? Where's our power? Like we think about the glory days and back in 82, like Uncle Rico. Um, like, you know, we, we, we have these ideas that God wants us to be strong. But his strength actually comes to us in our moment of weakness. And so like maybe the best thing we can do is to just be honest. To just be honest about the ways we feel disempowered so that we can actually receive the power of God that wants to rest on us, wants to come to us, wants to join us. And then finally, there's this amazing promise, this promise that says uh, to those who are victorious, to those who stay the course, to those who stay faithful, even in the midst of persecution, verse verse 12, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar in the temple of my God. A couple things going on here. One, um, the temple had been destroyed. In 70 AD, what had happened is uh, the the Jews around Jerusalem, they believed God was going to save them, so they sort of uh, bunkered themselves in, and the Roman legions surrounded the city, cut off all flow of 
goods and services in and out of the city, and they, it, was, it was horrifying. It was hell on earth. Uh, the, the prophecies that Jesus makes in like Matthew um, 24 and in Mark 13, where he's on the Mount of Olives and he's talking about this destruction that is coming, where not one stone will be left on top of each other. These things were fulfilled in 70 AD when the temple of Jerusalem is destroyed and Titus, the emperor, carries off all the stuff from the temple, the Jewish temple. The temple was a place where God, where heaven met earth, where God lived. This is where the Holy One of Israel lived and this temple was demolished. Its pillars were torn down and broken. It was devastating. And Jesus looks at these, this tiny little band of Christians meeting sort of in the shadow of the city of Philadelphia, and he says, you who are faithful, who stay the course, who trust in me, I will make you pillars in the temple of my God that will never be destroyed. That you are like pillars of what I am doing, of God's will coming on earth as it is in heaven. That you, that God sees you, that he knows you, that it's not in your strength, it's not in the stuff you are accomplishing, but it is in the faithfulness of your heart that God takes notice and he says, you will be pillars in the temple of my God. This beautiful promise that we are included if we are faithful, in this temple that will never be shaken, be used by God uh, to continue this missionary purpose of spreading this radically good news of who God is as revealed in Christ. God, we, um, we want to have ears to hear. We want to, God, be moved by what your spirit is saying to the churches. God, thanks for this message, this, just this revelation of who you are, Jesus, that you are the Holy One that you are true, you're the one who holds the keys of David, that you fling open the door of the kingdom. And God, you invite us all to come and to be a part of it. And so God, we, uh, we acknowledge our weakness, uh, the places where we're, we're just sort of done trying to be strong and we can't keep up the show anymore. And God, as we just confess, as we... Um, just acknowledge that we don't have what it takes. We trust that your spirit, that your power is going to rest on us, is going to flood into us, is going to meet us. Jesus, thanks for this, um, this radically good news of, of how you have been revealed, that you have gone the infinite distance, that you couldn't have gone an inch more. And you've proven that you loved us by loving us to the cross. God, move us, fill us with the same spirit, God, that we can share this message, we can demonstrate it with our lives, we can announce it with our words, God, to our community, to the people you love right around us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.